Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Charlie Nicklin. I'm the Chief Exec of IAGRI. As the title of the event suggests, we are here today to talk about T-levels. These are basically the new level three full-time land-based engineering qualification in England, which is an alternative to A-levels and apprenticeships. Through our involvement with the Land-Based Engineering and Technical Education Committee, which is LeTech, which some of you all know, we thought it was worthwhile bringing together a good cross-section of people from industry and the training providers to go through what they are and where they fit in with the other forms of education. We've got three speakers for you today, and then we'll finish with a Q&A session at the end. And rather than ask questions at the end of each presentation, if you could log them in the chat function at the bottom of the screen, along with your name, and then we'll uh, table those to the appropriate person. Uh, and we might have some time for some from free discussion at the end as well. So first, I'd like to introduce you to Chris Jones, who is the industry manager for land-based services at City and Guilds. Chris has a strong background in agriculture and land-based activities. Prior to his three years with CNG, Chris spent 26 years in land-based education, working in various colleges and universities across the country. City and Guilds have been awarded the contract to compile the qualification material for the colleges, and Chris will give you a general overview of T-levels, the background behind them and where they fit in. So I'll hand you over to Chris. Great, okay, so um, welcome everyone, and um, thank you for inviting me um, to, this, uh, to, to this webinar, um, and um, hopefully we will I'll talk about um, uh, the T levels um, and how they are an overview of the T levels and how they're working at the moment. Um, so basically, my presentation uh, will cover an overview of T levels. Um, it will discuss about agricultural land management production update and employee involvement, uh, level two and level three reforms. Um, it'll discuss about employer industry boards and uh, open floor questions, which we'll take at the end of all presentations. So um, the, the initial government vision here is, um, is basically you've got three, three boxes um, in front of you. You've got so the, the box on the left, which says A-levels, um, the box in the middle, which says T-levels, and the box on the right, which says apprenticeships. And the government's vision in England is, um, is to have uh, post-16 students um, opt for one of these particular choices. So obviously A-levels, academic levels, T-levels, technical levels, and apprenticeships. Now, known full well that apprenticeships, it, uh, it needs a, a place of work and it needs employment. Um, so that can, can be fine for some people, or it can be a, a problem for others. Um, individuals might not be um, mature enough to, to, to go into work straight away at the age of 16. And so another technical approach, technical qualification approach would be going to a, a college um, and studying your T level, your technical level qualification. So they're the three pathways that students um, in, the, in the future will, will have. So <clears throat> the T level programme composition here um, it is about, uh, first of all, there is um, core theory, concepts and skills for an industry area. So this is an overview, common uh, theories and concepts within the land-based industries. And then there are specialist skills and knowledge for an occupational area or a career area. Um, and uh, this, is, this would be for, in, in this case, for agricultural engineering as, as, a, as a specific occupational area. It has an industry placement with an employer. So uh, many, many uh, colleges deliver uh, level three uh, qualifications now with work, work placements. But the work placements has been sort of hiked up and it is 45 to 60 days over a two year period that, um, that is required here. 315 to 420 hours work of, of occupational work experience. Um, also, the qualification will support students to improve their English and maths, as currently going on now with students that uh, re require a certain level of maths and English. And there's going to be tutorial and pastoral care enrichment activities as well. So this is the sort of an overview of, of a T-level. There is the core theory, concepts and skills of an industry area. Then it goes down into more specialist skills and knowledge. 
and that's backed up by industry placement and support and ever support of improving English and maths. So a little bit of a slide here just to sort of visualise what we're talking about here. There are two main qualifications within the land-based T-levels. There's an animal care and management and there's agricultural land management and production pathway. And that's the one we're really interested in today, because as you can see under the agricultural land management production pathway, you can actually see land based engineering. And that's one of the specialist pathways. Um, uh, and you can see that there within within agricultural land management production, you have horticultural crop production, trees and woodlands, floristry, land based engineering, livestock production and then further down specialist uh, occupational specialisms and mainly in land-based engineering there isn't an additional occupational specialism in this land-based engineering but i just draw your attention to trees woodlands and management over the consultation period over the last 12 months ifate who this this is their qualification have uh, have looked at uh, this particular area and split it into forestry and arboriculture and that's something that could happen in future years. But at the moment, this is what we're seeing. And this is what we're, we are developing the qualifications for I-8 on. So the, the structure of the technical qualification um, is, is, is basically, you can see here, this just sort of rounds up what the previous slide was about. The technical qualification TQs for short are split into two main components, uh, the core, which is, which is assessed by external exams and employer set project. Keep going back to employ, that's the key word here, and an occupational specialism, OS, which is assessed by a synoptic assignment. And there you can see the, the occupational specialisms um, there, land-based engineering is, is identified. So this slide has a look at the guided learning hours associated with these qualifications and on the left hand side you have the common core which is for agriculture environment animal care common core then you've got the sub core pathways which land-based engineering has its own and then occupational specialisms land-based engineering has its own draw your attention to the right hand column look under land-based engineering row the right hand column has got 1400 hours. Now a full time level three qualification currently is 1080 hours. This is 1400 hours. So the content of this qualification in land based engineering is enough to warrant an increase in the number of delivery hours, guided learning hours. And it's 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 one of the highest. That and trees and woodland management are, are the same, 1400. But you can see in some other occupational areas, such as floristry, it's 1320, et cetera, and the difference there and some of the others. This means centres will, will, will be paid more to deliver these programmes because of the number of increased hours associated with them, which means uh, colleges can spend more time with individual students delivering these qualifications compared to what they're doing now. So an update for the technical qualification um, here, um, it's um, the land based engineering, along many others, have um, were submitted for approval to the Institute, Ofqual and DFE back in December, a couple of months ago, December 2022, and we are currently uh, reviewing the feedback. Um, these qualifications are due to go live for registrations for students this coming September, September 2023. And just a note, where we have had lots of employer engagement and employers have come up with some issues with some of the qualifications. And for this example here, the development of the habitat management occupation of specialism is paused at the moment, while whilst being aligned to the standards that have been revised. So where you have um, a slight mismatch with what with the standards and the occupational specialism, um, IFATE will stop and actually um, review um, and, and get it right before they start launching it. So habitat management has been delayed, but land-based engineering carries on. 
So ways for employers to be involved, and this is key, the government overall strategy, which I'll come to a bit later on in my presentation, identifies employer engagement um, has, has been increased tremendously. And um, it's all about people leaving school, getting further educated, either through, as I was saying before, A-levels or T-levels or apprenticeships, and then moving into a job, a good job, a career job. And to do that, employers, businesses need to be involved because you are at the forefront of development. And, um, and so your involvement will make sure that the colleges and the qualification, the new T-level qualification is at a standard, is at a level, includes the content that you want your new young employees to have. Um, and so it's critical. So employers, um, uh, the ways to be involved here, that there are two sort of stages. The first stage is standard setting and where we produce the materials and we call them GSUMs, which is, which is basically a guide to standards, amplification materials, bit of a grand title, bit of a mouthful. Um, didn't come up with that myself, I must admit. But um, it's there to, to ensure that the uh, centres are delivering to the same standards that the, the knowledge, skills and understanding uh, assist to minimal threshold competence. And we'll be producing these materials with employers to make sure they are correct. And we are recruiting now um, and onboarding, as we call it, bringing employers um, to in inter city and guilds to basically start to look at these GSUMs, these guide standards amplification materials. And that started now. And you might have already had some social media, you might have been contacted uh, by a city and guilds member to be part of this. If you're not, then there will be a slide coming up which identifies the person to contact shortly. The second part where employers get involved is through assessment production. It's how and what is included within the assessments to, 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 to make sure that the, assess, the assessments are, are advantageous, are supportive, do identify um, the, the skills and knowledge required for the student to, to pass. This is, this is very key. So carrying on with the employer involvement, um, sitting guilds are setting up, and this is, they're just setting this up now, so this is totally new, the employer strategy group. So th this group is specifically for the technical qualifications in agricultural land management production, and will be made up of employer industry members across all occupational specialisms. So within land-based engineering, there are many sort of various specialisms. And so it's, it's really key for us at City and Guilds to make sure that we understand and we have members representing those, those areas. Um, and the, and, and the, the aims of the group are to develop and implement approaches of engagement with the wider industry and businesses to help ensure a range of businesses within the occupational specialisms, OSs, are represented, to promote employer involvement, uh, to form links between employers and providers, so providers can link in with employers and vice versa, so there is a cross-fertilisation cross of knowledge and skills provide an overview on current challenges and pinch points within the sector, always will be challenges, and we need to be able to overcome them. Assist with planning, work for assessment, uh, uh, materials, validation, ongoing maintenance, and be uh, uh, an information and guidance source. So it's really key that the employer strategy group um, is, is made up of a number of employers that represent, comprehensively represents that, that occupational area. In this case, we're talking about land-based engineering. Then we have annual ambassadors to continue the uh, uh, ways employees can be involved. Annual ambassadors. So we are now in, in, in rec recruiting uh, ambassadors for uh, across the occupational specialism and on, on objectives to promote and benefit of T-levels and support, support sorry, uh, the employer strategy group. Um, all employers that get involved will, will be highlighted for their, for their work 
um, and their businesses through their logos being put onto the various websites, etc., will be able to will be prom will be promoted. Um, and once we get into the nitty gritty of the qualification, people who actually are uh, uh, supplying us with their time will be rewarded. This in terms of a payment, um, and this is this has been set up. Um, so once the qualifications are up and running, people will will be uh, reimbursed for their for their time. Now some businesses might not want reimbursement, but they want recognition of their involvement. And some businesses will say, well, if I'm providing uh, some people within the some employees within my business a few days a year, I I need some. Uh, um, some some payment for that and we can totally understand that so if you'd like to get involved the person to contact is one of my colleagues sally green and um, sally's email is sally.green at cityandguilds.com and she'd love to hear from you all employers um, and uh, obviously in terms of land-based engineering employers to get involved and and she will discuss with you in more detail um becoming an ambassador or, or or whatever area that you'd like to to get involved with as much as you can provide now center support there is a lot of support required by the centers as soon as the qualification g sums the handbooks are developed um, and we are we're looking at uh, next month um to have a lot of this information ready for centers the outline content anyway so we have a dedicated technical advisors for, for, for within the land based uh, services sector that which will be contacting and and do work with centers, colleges, etc. We have a timeline of events for pre delivery and planning. Um, we have webinars. We have regional networks and occupational special preparation and support. Um, so a lot of that is going on and the person to contact here is our, our uh, technical advisor for land is, is uh, Sarah Cox. So it's sarah.cox at cityandguilds.com. And uh, so if you are a centre, um, please contact Sarah. Um, you've probably been in contact with her already, but if not, there is Sarah's email email address there. So it's just a, just a round up on the two emails, really. Um, as an employer, it will be sally.green at cityandguilds.com. And for censors, it's uh, sarah.cox at sittingguilds.com. Now, <clears throat> nice chap in a tractor, always a good photograph. Level two and level three reforms. Now, these are the government reforms. This is what the, over the last 15 years that I can remember, there's been various government papers uh, being produced uh, moving things forward. And I always remember uh, the, the, one of the main papers that the government wholeheartedly adopted was the Sainsbury's report in 2016. So, you know, some seven years ago now, um, but previous reports have been going on and looking at vocational education. And so the government has set out in the skills for jobs white paper, um, are reforming post-16 uh, further education and skills and, uh, and is at the heart of the plans to level up the country. As you know, the government's uh, strategy to level up the country and, um, and so basically they totally understand that there are different um, experiences happening throughout the country um, and they want that to be the same experience throughout England. Um, and that is that is a, a, a particular point the government are making here. And the skills for jobs white paper is that leveling up legislation for education. Uh, just to make a note here, really, this is England only. Um, we have devolved, devolved governments for Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland, and they are not following this particular pathway, but they're in review at the moment. And I know there is a vocational review consultation going on in Wales currently, which will be available and finalised at the end of the summer, early autumn. And um, that should uh, uh, provide direction for our nations, Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland. But this is England, yeah. Uh, by, and the government saying, by creating a technical education system that competes with the world's best, every individual should be able to access high quality qualifications that help them develop the knowledge, skills and behaviours needed to get great jobs 
and contribute to the thriving economy. So this is key now. 16 year olds will be leaving school and identifying a pathway as A levels, T levels or apprenticeships. And if they're identifying a pathway in T levels and apprenticeships, they will be going into a sort of a more of a skills based uh, educational system and working towards a career goal. And that career goal will lead on to a job, uh, lead on to a career, and that career should help the economy thrive. The young people will benefit from clear progression pathways, high quality qualifications, as uh, I said before. Um, adults also will benefit from high quality qualifications, not so much with T levels, but within the education reforms. Um, we, as Hitting Guilds and Warding Organisation, are looking at adults, which is 19 plus. T levels are for 16 to 19. I just want to make a point here that if someone starts a T level at 19, they will be able to continue until they complete it. And they might be 21 uh, as, an, uh, as an example. But basically, if you're an, an adult and, you, and, and you, want, you want to change a career or you want to uh, uh, get some more qualifications, we are looking at adult qualifications that, that will, will, will align with T levels, but they're for adults. And so taking on already what the adult has in terms of experience um, and skills. And employers will benefit from a clearer um, skills system uh, uh, based on employer led occupational standards. Again, employer, employer, employer is key to these reforms. So the aim of the government's reforms, the overall aim here is, to, is a simplified system of high quality qualifications that supports progression to positive outcomes for all students, stronger links between the classroom and the workplace, putting the employers and standards at the heart of the design of all technical qualifications. And to be able to do this, the government are removing removal of 16 to 19 funding approval uh, from level three qualifications that overlap with T levels from 2024 and on 2025. And in land, it's from 2025 onwards. So to make this happen, the government will be removing funding for new starters of qualifications in 2025 of qualifications that are out there now within the land-based area and uh, that overlap with the T level. The T level will be there to replace um, that and then obviously to supporting adults to upskill and retain. So I just want to move on to what City and Guilds uh, um, have set up and set up for a couple of years now. We have employer in, in and industry boards, EIBs as we call them, and these industry boards are set up to bring together individual employers and membership organisations. And this is a sort of a, not just for T levels, this is a, a general um, board consists of, um, in, in my area, and I manage five employer boards, and you can see them there, agricultural, and agricultural engineering, animal and equine, floristry, forestry and agriculture and habitat management and horticulture. And uh, the reason why we've got five individual boards is because they, uh, um, you know, floristry um, employers probably do not have a syn synergy too much with agricultural engineering employers. And so we've, we've split them and also for numbers as well. Um, we have over 90 employers on, on the EIB uh, register and um, they are there for city and guilds to let people know what's happening um, within education, keep them, keep them up to date and also to uh, let people know what qualifications we are currently involved with development at the moment. And it's not just key levels, we develop a lot of certificate of competence, license to practice qualifications. Um, etc., as well as other qualifications that do not overlap with T levels. And there's my email address there. And so, if you want to know more about uh, employer industry boards, not just for T levels now, this is a, a generalistic qualification board, then please contact me, Christopher.jones at cityandguilds.com, where we can, I can uh, uh, discuss the deep, more detail uh, uh, with you. It's, but just to emphasize, it's really important that employers from all specialisms get involved with the T-levels. The T-levels are across all uh, curriculum areas, all occupational areas, construction, business, the whole works. Um, we have just been talking about the land-based area here and then more specifically about agricultural engineering, which, we'll, which some of my uh, present, presenters will, will be discussing. 
Um, and just want to say thank you very much. Um, we'll take some questions um, and we'll um, try and answer them later on in the presentation. So, 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 so thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and, and pass back on to Charlie. Okay, thanks for that, Chris. It's worth mentioning that IAGRI and the Ag Engineers Association, the AEA, are both members of the industry board, so you can access that through either of our organisations. Um, so our next speaker today is David Kirshner. Dave asks, acts as an independent consultant to Leetech and has been heavily involved in the development and review of both the current land-based engineering apprenticeships and also the new T-level. David is from an agricultural background. He did his apprenticeship and early training with an MF dealership and then climbed the ladder in a variety of service manager and director roles with a number of different tractor manufacturers and dealers before turning his hand to consultancy. David is going to talk us through the land-based engineering T-level qualification, the importance of the industrial placement and what to expect from students coming out with the qualification. Okay, I'll hand over to David. Brilliant, that's me. Okay. Okay, so um, my name is David Kirshner and I am independent. So I'd just like to say that the views I express are my own views. They're, they're not third party views, they're my own. They might be a little controversial, but there we are. So next, Sarah, please. So as already stated, we are talking about qualifications and I'll mention apprenticeships that affect England only. And it's unfortunate that um, the devolved nations are gonna do their own thing, which does cause us some problems in our industry because we do operate across borders. We have employers operating across borders, but there it is, we can't change it. So next please, Sarah. So I'm going to go into the Lord Sainsbury report a little bit deeper because this is the start. This was the birth of T-levels and I would advise you all to actually read the report because it makes an absolute load of sense. It's logical. It's a really good overview and, and in actual fact it was the first review of technical education for over 100 years. So, which tells us we, we had qualification structures in place that have been in place for a long time that weren't particularly suitable. And what the report came out with was that there were 13,000 different qualifications for young people to choose from, which was very confusing. It was confusing for employers as well. And if you added in the other qualifications for over 19 year olds, there were 21,000 qualifications out there. So um, they determined that young people required a, a clear educational route to specific occupations, which makes an awful lot of sense to me. And that employers required technical qualifications that gave threshold competency. And I want to talk about threshold competency and what it is, um, because it's not clearly defined. I've got my own interpretation. So to find employment, obviously young people need credible qualifications that are valued by employers. And they determined that technical education at levels two and three should only be offered through a single awarding body. In the past, there were two, three, four, and if you look at the devolved nations, a multiple of awarding bodies who all had their own twist on the same qualification. And they agreed that apprenticeships and technical education standards need to be aligned, which makes absolute sense, really. So next, please, Sarah. So pre T level, we had the diploma. And as an employer in a previous life, people had come to me with a diploma and a diploma quite honestly didn't mean anything to me. It could mean anything you wanted it to mean. And so uh, employers were really confused about what the diploma meant. And from my experience, the best way if you employed somebody was to actually employ them, have them with you for a couple of weeks, and then you could evaluate them. But with a, a T-level, a T-level will be a T-level and it will be delivered to a set format. So employers should have more confidence in what they're getting. 
Next, please, Sarah. So within the report, um, they determined a national system of technical qualifications will only work if industry takes ownership of the content. And the point I must make is for employers, this is your qualification. Nobody else's, it's your qualification and you have to take ownership. And that young people will only value a qualification if employers actually value it. Otherwise, why you actually do it? So I've, I've actually put in a link to uh, the report there. And if you have time, please do take the time to read it. So for me, the, the T level will only be a success if everybody gets behind it and pushes it forward. And obviously, the government have got some say in that as well. OK, education is political. It's very, very political. OK, so next please, Sarah. So th this is information hot off the press last week. And it gives you an indication of, of how much investment the government are putting into T-levels. This isn't something that's just going to disappear. I mean, change brings along with it positive and negative con uh, connotations. And I'm sure people will view T-levels with some suspicion. But the government are proposing that for this next year, academic year, they're going to have a 10% uplift on T-level funding. So 10%, they're saying that's going to be at 30 million. So obviously, we're talking about 330 million investment in T-levels in, in the coming academic year. They're going to have an employer support fund, OK? And the support fund will be used to aid employers with the work placements or the industry placements. Uh, they're going to provide a one-off payment to, uh, to assist career guidance. I think that will go into the educational establishments. And they've got a, a pot of £80 million for training providers uh, they will allocate that to training providers to invest in specialist equipment. So um, from the government side, it, it's a sizable investment. So don't think this is just a passing fad. I mean, it is here to stay. So um, from, from this presentation, you should be able to follow the links and find this information for yourself. Okay, so next please, Sarah. What is a T-level qualification? Okay, so it's going to be a two-year course open to 16 to 19 years old, delivered through FE colleges. Whether or not that will change, I don't know. I mean, one thing I've learned through being involved with apprenticeships and T-levels is that the guidelines and the goalposts move all the time. So we'll have to see how things develop. So the T-level is aligned to the level three land-based engineering apprenticeship standards. Uh, what I have to say is that we are in the middle of reviewing the apprenticeship standards. So there will be tweaks to be made to the T-level in future. Students will spend 80% um, of their time in face-to-face -face tuition and 20% of their time in a work placement or industry placement. Now, what you have to remember is that the industry placement is mandatory, okay? It is part of the qualification. So when these um, candidates are actually in the workplace, they are completing part of their qualification. So the T-level will contain exams and assessments. It's not just awarded, you have to earn it. Um, and it will be graded to pass merit distinction at distinction plus. And the next point is, is this four letter word, the F word, okay, you can fail. Um, but if you fail in this case, you'll get a, a statement of achievement, but at least the employer will know what he's getting. Okay, next please, Sarah. Okay, so 
the assessments. Now, I've, I've been involved in the validation meetings with city and guilds. And I would say probably um, through the validation groups, we've been given city and guilds quite a hard time when it's come to assessments and um, exams because we've been really keen as industry to make sure that it, it does reflect what's required and it is a level playing field. Okay, so next. So this is a T-level gateway into land-based engineering. And as, as a sort of 17, 18 year old, I stood in the place of candidates I was there and all I wanted to do was be involved as a land-based engineer. When I started there, I didn't think I was going to be technical director of, of a tractor importing company. I, I'd had no view about the future. I just wanted to get into the industry. And, and as an industry, we have to encourage candidates to actually take that step. And once we've got them through education and employers, we need to develop them into what, what we need. And for all three of those stakeholders, there are advantages, okay, through T levels. Next, please, Sarah. Okay, so the, the T level framework. Um, when I joined the working group, um, this is what we were presented with, okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a similar slide to the one that uh, Chris used. Um, it's got the same detail on it, but this was the original. And if we look at core and we look at occupational specialisms, you can see that you had the choice to vary the amount of time that you put into core um, as a ratio to occupational specialisms. And for me, if I'd had my way, I would have had at least 80% of the time in occupational specialisms. Unfortunately, we couldn't dictate that um, because when it came to T-levels, we were working with the, less, the rest of the land-based industries. So we've got what we've got. And when it comes to occupational specialisms, I'm not, I'm not gonna talk about those. We all know what land-based technology is. We've had center-based qualifications before. We know what we've got to deliver. So I, I'm in this presentation, I'm not gonna talk about what goes into those specialisms. And that will change to align with the new apprenticeships. <coughs> I'm more interested in the T-level placements, and I want to talk about that more. Maths and English, we're all, we're all aware of what has to go in there. And um, the other requirements, we didn't stipulate any particular uh, qualification or license or anything in our T-level in land-based engineering because we are so diverse as a sector. Next, please. Okay, so will there be a separate T-level qualification for each sector of land-based engineering? No. So it, it's a one size fits all and it will fit where it touches, but at least it does cover the basics, okay? What I want to do is try and set the expectation level for employers from the T-level, okay? So it's a one size fits all T-level for land-based engineering. That's all of the different sectors, okay? Next. Now, the elephant in the room, as far as I'm concerned, um, and I'm, I'm independent, I'm being a realist, I've spent 50 years in customer service and, and um, my history is I find solutions to problems or I provide solutions to problems and analyze the situation. So there is an elephant in the room and the elephant in the room for me will be the industry placements because if we don't overcome the industry placements, the qualification is gonna fail. I, I, I'm just being honest. And whilst we, you know, this cute little elephant here um, doesn't look too harmful, I'm afraid that in 2024, it's gonna be a big elephant in the room that we have to deal with. Next. So what is an industry placement? 
Um, they're a mandatory element of the qualification. They provide hands-on experience and an insight into the job role, which is fantastic. The administration will fall upon the training providers, so that's extra work for you, for you guys to do. Industry placements consist of a minimum of 45 days. Um, and how the 45 days are actually time-tailed is a matter for employer and training provider. But obviously, you wouldn't want to put a T-level student out into industry in the first 12 months, I wouldn't have thought. I think it will come into the second 12 months when at least they've learned something and, and they've got some of the basic skills and knowledge. Um, so we can develop the, the candidate, at least give them an insight into the workplace. And they'll, they'll give the employer the opportunity um, to ensure that young candidates are developing the knowledge, skills and behaviours that are required by industry. Next. Can employers host multiple students in, on a uh, industry placement? Yes, you can. If, if you can fit it into your business and you've got the mentors to do it. Are employers obliged to pay a T-level student on an industry placement? No, okay? It's part of their qualification but there's nothing to stop the employer making a contribution or there's nothing to stop the employer coming to a private arrangement with the candidate to, to maybe work at um, weekends or whatever. They, they can develop relationships with the candidate and that's a valuable part of the T-level, I think. So there's plenty of guidance and those are the links to the guidance on industry placements. So next please, Sarah. Will employers, uh, will their employee liability insurance cover them when they've got these students there? Yes. Read the guidance. Okay. Um, your, it's your responsibility and your problem. Okay, as an industry, we need young people coming into the industry. We need to provide them with qualifications and it is our responsibility. So as an industry, the employers have to take up this responsibility. They, they have to become more involved. So involve yourself as an employer with City and Guilds. Uh, Chris has told you how you can do that. Just register your interest. Do it now before the T-level starts, okay? Provide work placements for T-level students. You need to do that as a service to your industry. It is your responsibility. Nobody's going to do it for you. Contact land-based engineering colleges. Uh, make them aware that you're there, that you're interested in taking students uh, on a placement, or that you will actually employ students. There needs to be a much closer bond between employers and education. Okay. And for employers, if you want to find a college who are delivering uh, land-based qualifications, just go to the Landex site and there's the link. Next, please. So the advantages for T-levels of T-levels for land-based engineering. I mean, it's not just land-based engineering, it's for all sectors. An opportunity, opportunity to promote industry to a greater number of young people. We need to raise our profile. And as an industry, we are, we are taking steps to do that. T-levels create a recruitment pool. Um, so employers should be able to go to a college and say, look, I am interested in, in a candidate. Can you let me know? Or um, can you put me in contact if you want to take them on as a, in an industry placement? A T-level student in theory, should be able to make an informed decision when they look at um, taking on a job. Employers can be confident or more confident that T-level candidates actually know the job that they're coming to and are less likely to start the job, think, no, this isn't for me, and then leave. For um, employers, T-level candidates, they should offer a much quicker route to return on investment. Okay, rather than taking somebody straight out of school. 
because these guys will have the underpinning skills. And um, candidates with a T-level qualification, they'll be old enough to drive, which obviously makes rural areas more accessible to them and will help um, in their usefulness. Next, please. T-levels compared to apprenticeships. Okay, so I'm a, a great believer in apprenticeships and there is a clear distinction between T-levels and apprenticeships. So a T-level delivered over 24 months, 80% theory, 20% practical. And with the apprenticeship delivered over 36 to 48 months and it's the reverse, 20% theory, 80% practical. So T-level outcome is this word, or these words, threshold competency, which I struggle with, but I, this is my interpretation. The essential, the essential knowledge and skills that everybody in a job needs to minimally be effective, okay? The outcome of the apprenticeship is occupational competency, knowledge and skills and occupational behaviors acquired fully support occupational productivity. That's my interpretation. Yours might be different. So T-levels complement apprenticeships, they don't replace them. Next, please. So managing expectations. Uh, from the outset, the objective was the T-level should actually achieve threshold competency. And if I'm honest, I'm not sure that that is really a realistic expectation. And my interpretation, uh, bearing in mind, this is my own personal interpretation, it will give them employment competency, okay? So they'll, they'll have the basic knowledge, skills and behaviors to actually perform within a job doesn't mean that they'll be, uh, would have reached a threshold competency. There will be limits. Land based um, engineering T level occupational specialisms compared to other T levels are hugely, they're numerous and so diverse. We've got a really diverse sector. It has been really challenging to capture the content within the T level parameters. Okay. Uh, due to the complexity of land-based engineering, it, it might be possible to ladder up from the T-level to an apprenticeship, a level three apprenticeship. Now, this wasn't the original intention of the government, but um, they are considering it. And at the moment, IFATE, and I, I mean, it's we keep on using these um, acronyms. IFATE is the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education. Um, they are actually looking at any deficits between the T-level and the apprenticeship. And they will consider uh, laddering up to an apprenticeship. And there's a, already been a precedent set with engineering. Okay, but that wasn't the original intention. A T-level was a standalone qualification. Okay, um, so if there is uh, funding or agreement that we can ladder up, the minimum duration of the apprenticeship to ladder up would be 12 months. Okay, it's got to be a 12 month duration to qualify to be an apprenticeship. Okay, next. Um, this is what I've done is taken Chris's slide and I just want to illustrate when I say it's been difficult to fit the T level into the parameters. If we look at the rest of the land based apprenticeships, they were all 24 month apprenticeships and our apprenticeship that we've actually squeezed into the same parameters was a 36 month apprenticeship. Uh, hence the reason why I, I'm saying Yes, great, with the other T-levels in land-based, I'm sure it will give threshold competency because they'll have the time to deliver it. But with land-based, I think we've got far too much and 
we don't want to build expectations too high because uh, it will fail. We have to understand what the T-level will produce for us. Okay, so with land-based engineering, we've squeezed a 36-month apprenticeship into a 24-month qualification. Other sectors have squeezed a 24-month apprenticeship in. Okay, Sarah, sorry, I'm speeding up. <laughs> um, so expectations, newly qualified, uh, qualified T-level students will not perform at the same level as qualified apprenticeships. They will require guidance and mentoring. They will require experience and training. They will not have, an, and it would certainly be unreasonable to expect um, specific brand uh, franchise knowledge. <clears throat> A fully developed set of practical skills, full understanding of the advanced technology. A comprehensive understanding and ability to fault find on complex machinery, uh, the ability to operate product specific machinery, the experience required to undertake the full spectrum of what they're going to be faced with. Okay, and I'm saying this for employers, so the expectations are realistic. Okay, will the newly qualified T level uh, student have the same capabilities as an apprentice? No, of course not. Okay, next, Sarah. So expectations must match reality. And I, I mean, what I will say is the T-level qualification, I think the rationale behind it is absolutely right. I fully support it 100%, but it will only work if industry works with education to make it work. So that's me. Hopefully it's, um, it's thought provoking and um, it will promote some discussion. Thanks for your time. Okay, thank you for that, David. Uh, so we'll jump on to the final speaker today, which is Melvin Johnson. Melvin has spent 30 years in the land-based education sector, both as a lecturer and in management and quality assurance roles. Melvin is a consultant to Lantra, where he is the lead assessor for land-based engineering apprenticeships. And he has also consulted for C&G on the development and imp implementation of the new T-level. So Melvin's going to take us, how, take us through how the T-level will function with the training providers, uh, such as the modules, the assessment methods, and so on. So over, the, over to you now, Melvin. Good morning, everybody. Yes, and it, it is still, still just morning, so good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different view of the T-level course than uh, Chris and, and David has taken in, in, in respect of I'm going to look at it from a student's point of view. So somebody that um, is thinking of coming on a, a land-based uh, engineering T-level course, what kind of what's in front of them uh, for the next two years of their life. So the first sort of kind of question I think would, would be asked, so what, what, what are the course aims? So that I've just picked up uh, two aims here, which are directly from uh, IFATE. And as David said earlier on, just to make sure everybody's fully aware, IFATE stands for the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education. So, um, you know, the, this T-level is meant to prepare young people to enter, uh, the, in, our, in our case, land-based engineering industry, uh, at a, um, and this could be at an employment or an a, a apprenticeship level. But also, um, also quite importantly, it should give young people the opportunity to progress on to higher education courses, which of course it's predecessor courses like the national, the BTEC national diplomas and the um, uh, Sitting Hills te uh, technical qualifications did. So that's quite an important part uh, uh, for, the, for the qualification. So again, if I was if I was a student, I'd be picking out more or less what uh, quite, a, quite a few points that David and and, and uh, Chris had, had mentioned this morning. And I kind of think the things that would be important to me would be that you know that this qualification sits within the land based and uh, sorry the land based engineering sits within the uh, the agriculture land management and production T level qualification. So that's where it sits. So it's going to be um, you know very much focused on. 
uh, on, the, on the land based industries. Um, it is a theory and a skills development, which I think that is really quite important to me because I, you know, I do want to know about things, but I also want to be able to do stuff. So this qualification will do that for me. Uh, it's going to take me two years to complete. Um, so, uh, you know, if I'm if I'm leaving school at 16 and 17, I'm going to be kind of finishing by the time I'm maybe 18 or 19, which uh, I can go out into the world of work there, but I can also go into um, the, the, the uh, uh, HE world at the same age as probably me mate who's just done A-levels. So that, that's quite important to me also. Um, first registrations, I think this, uh, this has been mentioned, is September 23. So um, there will be quite a number of the uh, land-based colleges um, around the country that are, will be starting this qualification in, in, in 23. Not all, some may continue to carry on with the, the City and Girls and the, the BTEC Nationals for another year or so, as Chris mentioned. Age group then, I've got to be 60, somewhere between 16 and 19 to, to start this programme. And the entry requirements are actually are set by the colleges. They're not set by IFAT or not set by City and Guilds. But generally speaking, we're looking at somebody with an appropriate level two qualification or GCSEs at grade four and five. Um, I can't be too, too much more um, uh, accurate with this because um, colleges will set their own their own entry requirements, but of course, a college that takes a, a, a student onto any course has got to feel that they're they're capable of succeeding. So they would, you know, a college wouldn't be taking somebody on on a on, on a T level program if they didn't think they would succeed. And of course, which is a final final point there, it includes a forty five plus days work experience. OK, so if, if I was now sort of interested in uh, thinking about what sort of subject areas I might be covering over the next two years, the subject areas kind of fit into three categories, really. I think Chris mentioned this a bit earlier on. There's a core content, there's a pathway content and a specialist content. Uh, so the core content, um, the, the, I'm not going to go through, read through them all, I'll let you all read those sort of titles. But effectively, that this is going to take around about 10% of my learning time. So about 10% of my time over the next two years, I'll be uh, studying those sort of subjects there, which will give me a breadth of knowledge so I would be able to be effective in, 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 in the world of work. The next sort of category, uh, is referred to as the pathway core content. Now this is, as you can see, there's 20% of the learning time. Um, now this kind of studies and some of the some of the topic areas here are very similar to the, the, the previous slide, but this now is covering those topics uh, in a more of a, a land-based engineering context. So it's a little bit more closer to, to uh, uh, what I'm likely to see when I go out on my uh, works experience or when I eventually go into the world of work. Okay. And the next one, which is the specialist contact content, which I kind of think if I was a, a student, uh, you know, interested in, in land-based engineering and uh, was wanting to do this, this program. These are, the, these are the words that I'd be looking for, to be honest. You know, I'm, I'm going to be sort of maintaining the machinery. I'm going to be repairing diagno and diagnosing faults and that sort of thing. Now, um, this, of course, is the largest chunk. This is the 70% of the learning time. So I think if I was a student seeing that, that the 10% on the broader issues, the 20% on the, the more in con context issues and the 70 percent in the uh the specialist context i think i'd be i'd be quite comfortable with that i think okay just now moving on to sort of the uh the work the work placements um a lot have been said about this earlier on but these are the kind of key things i think i would pick up you know, that takes place in a real working commercial environment. Uh, I can't, you know, I can't 
uh, do this working at the college where I'm studying. I've got to do this in, in a in commercial environment. Um, and it'd be great if it was relevant to the occupational specialism that I want to develop my career in. And kind of think what I mean there is if I'm, if I'm thinking of developing my career in maybe horticultural engineering, it'd be great to get a placement um, in an horticultural engineering uh, um, workshop. I can, however, I can split the placements across employers uh, where necessary. So I could have uh, 20 days with one employer and 20 days with, with another, as long as they all meet the, the criteria that's set out um, uh, by IFAT. As has already been said, a minimum of it's 315 hours, which is approximately four days. I think that's a uh, um, 40, sorry, 45 days. I think that's 45 days at seven hours a, a day or something like that. But in, in, in the main, it's it's round about a minimum of 45 days. Um, it's got to be completed within normal working patterns. I think I'd like that, you know, because I, I want to go and get this experience working with other people that are carrying out their, their duties normally. So I want to be starting at the same time as them. I want to be finishing. I want to have my breaks the same time as them. So as I'm, I'm actually feeling part of that team. And I, I think that would be quite important. And as already has been mentioned, there is no actual fixed mode of implementation. So, um, you know, if it suits my employer to be to go to him one day a week, that'd be fine. If it suits them for me to go on a block, um, a four week block every now and again, that would also be fine. So the, the, there are no sort of strict rules and regulations there. And this, uh, this bit here is, of course, going to be assessed. As a student, this would be quite, quite uh, uh, important to me. Um, so there are two externally set and two externally marked exams. Uh, and those are two hours each. There are nine practical skills assessments. These are externally set and internally assessed. So um, that, that has taken 25 hours. So that, that would give me, a, I think that would give me a little bit of confidence in the fact that, hang on, the skills that I'm, I'm developing on this course, people, people see those as being quite important and then spending quite a bit of time making sure that I've reached the skill level that the qualification says I've got. And then finally, there's a project, which I do over, over sometime during the two years, which is ex an externally set project uh, and externally marked. And that's about 17 hours to, to, to do that. So those are, the, those, are the way, those are the ways that I'm going to be tested when I finish my, uh, when I finish my T level. And just um, a couple of, again, this, Chris has gone into this in a lot more detail than I did. So from a, uh, from, I guess, from a, maybe from a parent's point of view now, I, I know that the college or, or the college that uh, um, uh, I should be going to, the, they, you know, they, they have got access to City and Gills technical advisors, and there, there are sample assessments and sample answers that uh, we can see, so that we can get a, a reasonably good idea of the of the levels and, and the, the expectations that the uh, the exams and and, and, the, uh, and so on will will want us to achieve. And, and that's it, really. I, I, I've tried to sort of keep my presentation relatively short and focus on the key things that I think um, a student, a potential student, would be interested in. Thank you. OK, right. I will do my best to... I was going to offer everybody a comfort break, but if everybody's happy to carry on um, or just disappear off and you might miss a bit of, of content, but I was just going to dive straight in with the questions because there are quite a lot, um, if that's okay with everybody. Uh, so I'll do my best to go through them. Uh, so the first one is from me. Um, and we mentioned Landex. So I'm saying, where do we find out which providers will be offering the T-level? Because not all of them will. Um, I know you can go on Landex and then manually go and interrogate the colleges. But is there going to be a listing of providers that are providing a T level? That's probably best, best aimed at Chris, I guess. So yeah, um, so there will be uh, more information coming about this. Um, a lot of colleges have already identified um, some time ago that they want to be involved in the first wave, if you like, starting in 2023. 
as developments have taken place, um, then then it just it depends on if colleges are going to step in on 2023 or 2024, they'll have to step in at 2025. So every principal is talking, you know, to their colleagues and trying to work out what they want to do. Um, there are some colleges that are going to go straight in and that this information will be no notified and communicated to, to everyone on various websites fairly soon. OK, all right. Thank you. Um, so the next question is from Malcolm Carr West. Have universities been involved in developing T levels and how will maths at the appropriate level uh, for entry onto a, an MEng higher education course be covered? That's probably best aimed at you again, Chris. Actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no problem. Um, so, so uh, T levels will attract UCAS points um, for progression onto higher education. That's how university sort of uh, a judge um uh candidates um so so yeah they will be able to progress on to university uh, uh places um now as we all know all individuals are individual people and so that's why the maths and english element of the overall program of a t level is is in place some students will be great practically vocationally and um will be will be going through all those practical uh, uh uh, tests very very quickly um, but might struggle with other elements and and trying to get their maths and their English to it to, to, to a level and uh, colleges have to provide support for for that so so you know with with all uh, everything taken uh, as as equal um, universities will interview the candidates um, they will be graded onto the T level. They'll have UCAS points to go on to an appropriate university placement. Um, but they will look at those individuals and see what uh, extra support is required, as as all educational providers do. So yes, it does attract UCAS points, and progression is available to go on to higher education. Okay. Uh, so next question is from Mike Harrington. From a training provider point of view, why would an employer take on an apprentice? when they can take on a T-level on the same qualification for free? Again, I think, I think, yeah, I think David and probably <coughs> might come in on this as well, but I think it's dependent on the individual employer really. Um, and, um, and, you know, what they see, um, they can support. Um, an apprentice requires a lot of support. They will get a, they will get a reward back fairly quickly, you know. Um, but an, an, a, a T-level candidate, um, a student, um, will will be supported at college first of all. I mean, it was muted around that. Uh, maybe the work experience for in the second year. That de really depends on the provider and and the individual person. What you probably will on take is that within the first sort of term the provider will be supporting the students in in making them ready for to be able to become you know that employability element um it will be key and some individual students will be much more advanced uh, much more mature uh, and be able to take on a, a, um, a, a work placement uh, much quicker than some others so that very much depends on 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 the on individuals there but um, i don't know if david and melvin have any other comments on that? Yeah, well, I, I think I think it's a good question for Mike actually, because what of, what of course we don't want to do is we don't want to pitch at T levels against apprenticeships. So they're a slightly different model. And I, I kind of think, Mike, if if you think about you know the, some of the students that you you've had recently, um, so, some sixteen year olds are not ready for full time employment uh, for whatever reason, and I, and I kind of think that that readiness um, will develop probably over a couple of years. And especially now we've got the, you know, the compulsory work experience in, in there, but they're, they're, they're not going to be able to operate as a full-time employee. Um, but I, un, I can understand that question and it, 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 is a, it, it, it is a difficult one, which I don't think can be answered you you, know, I don't too, too, too generally really. I don't think you can, to be honest. I mean, all employers, all candidates are individuals. I mean, what what happened to um, 
the candidates on full-time educational centre-based um, qualifications at the moment. You know, it's it's another choice really for the employer and the candidate. Yeah. And for me, that's got to be a positive move. I mean, just to just to um, add another uh, um, part to this equation, really, is is um, a 16 year old sometimes finds it difficult to get to that job role, that that apprenticeship and depends where that apprenticeship is. Um, so there can be some sort of gaps. And I know colleges right now are struggling with transportation, et cetera. But, you know, that that is something And what Melvin is saying and what David is saying is. Everyone is an individual person. Some are more mature than others. Some can be can go into a work uh, uh, situation, and others just need that little bit of time to develop. But you know, they will develop, and they will become an active employee um, thereafter. So it's just that sometimes people just need a little bit extra time. No one matures. You know, when you turn sixteen, you know, you don't suddenly change. Okay. Yeah, and, and some young people aren't built for the academic system, are they? And they'll they'll develop once they're outside of the academic system. Some some young people go to work. Uh, sorry, go to school. They don't know if they're going to eat, if they're going to be abused, or or whatever. And once they get out of that environment, they develop. So, um, I I think it's all positive. It it gives people choices. Okay. Um, so a question from Richard, uh, by employer, can a self-employed mechanic engage with this? I presume that's to offer a placement. Yeah, yeah. So so within the land, this is a bit of a broad sweeping statement here, but within the land based industries, there's about 47 percent are made up of self-employed one people bands, you know, um, and there's about 80 odd percent that are actually are SMEs, very small businesses. So, so in terms of the number of businesses, there's not that many large businesses. There are high percentages of small businesses or, or in the individual one, one person bands. So yeah, you can get involved. You, a self-employed person can get involved with supporting the T levels development and, and, and the annual maintenance of assessments throughout, um, and also can get involved with taking on a, a, a placement. Okay. Um... Question from Simon, how do the current round of local skills improvement plans, the LSIPs, feed into CNG's reforms? That's they're not CNG reforms, they're government reforms, and we are acting on, on, on those. So, yes, I mean, as you know, around England has been developed historically through many different uh, avenues, um, mining, manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So LSIPs are there to, to, to look at... Um, local requirements and needs, um, and it's supported by the local government, uh, goes into the national government, et cetera, and that's a way that the government can support funding to support those, those industries. Um, there is there's probably not a direct link to, to T levels through, through those local uh, partnerships, um, but overall there is a link, um, if, you, if, you, if you get my meaning on that. Okay. Uh, question from Richard, will large manufacturers engage with this when they can put learners on an apprenticeship instead? How broad is the area for the learner to find work experience, i.e. can they work in the ag Eng subsidiary, such as a farm where they home service? So a farm mechanic, basically. I, I haven't seen any, any real hard and fast guidance on this yet. Uh, I don't no. know if Chris has. But I, I, I kind of think what, what would be best for the individual is to try, you know, is for them and, and their, their provider to try and align their future career plans with the uh, uh, with the work experience. I know that's not, you know it's easy easy to say that it's, it's always uh, you know a bit more difficult, but I, I haven't seen any hard and fast guidance on that other than what what's already been mentioned this morning. When, uh, when we talk about large manufacturers engaging, I mean, really, what we're talking about is large employers engaging rather than manufacturers. Um, I don't know if we've got any manufacturers actually on this call and whether or not they've got a view on that. So I, I, just to um, speak from my point of view, I work for John Deere. Um, I work under Alan Cochran and, and he's... On holiday this week which is why i was supposed to join the meeting instead um i agree with what you're saying there david it's it's down to the employer um our 
I think what, what's been said today is quite good because it's actually highlighted the clear difference between the expectations of a T level and an apprenticeship. I think I don't get involved in that level of detail with, with the apprenticeship program between Alan and James fully. Um, I have very small involvement with it. My concern was something that Chris, you shared very early on where funding approval will get re reduced from or withdrawn. And just for clarity on that, is that, does that mean to say that the amount of funding that you can claim for a level three apprenticeship learner will be reduced or withdrawn if there is a crossover T level, or am I missing the point there? No, no. Can I answer that, Chris? Yeah, please. Yeah, I, I mean, the funding for the apprenticeships is the funding for the apprenticeships, and we're in the review process at the moment to update the apprenticeship, and the funding will be reviewed as part of that apprenticeship review. So right. the funding for T levels and apprenticeships is something that's completely different. The funding of a T level student to ladder up to an apprenticeship is something different as well. Right. So yeah, the, the apprenticeship funding won't be affected by, by T levels. Um, it will be affected by the review and government policy. And, you know, let's face it, government policy, <laughs> we're heading into this apprenticeship review and we're very mindful that we need to protect our funding band. I'm not sure if that aligns with the government's view and their objectives, <laughs> um, but it will be a struggle. But just, yeah, just, just, to add to, just to add to David uh, uh, there, um, my, my, my slide was referring to was that the current qualifications within colleges now at level three in England will be defunded. Therefore, colleges won't get a penny to deliver them. Therefore, they can't deliver them. That's how the government controls it. Um, oh, yeah. and, and funding will go on to the T levels. It's not connected, as David said, to apprenticeships. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah, because, you know, from, from our point of view, as, as you'll be aware, you know, we've got a fairly large apprenticeship program and dedicated facilities. And, and obviously you know, now we're not the only manufacturer to have that. And yes, I think T levels is a, um, a, a bit of a concern for us, because if it's deemed that it's a level three qualification and a level three is a level three, wherever that comes from, ultimately, um, you know it's a case of balancing out what the benefit to the dealer is on one hand you've got a higher learning outcome from an apprentice because ultimately they're spending more time on the job training over that course of the apprenticeship time um, and they can be profitable from them to a small amount we did some very fag packet calculations let's say um and to as to what and when they become profitable. Um, whereas actually, if you look at a T level, if they're saying that's gonna be two years, then all of a sudden that person is qualified a year sooner than an apprentice, potentially. So I think, you know, yes, it's all we're a bit hesitant around it because it, there is a potential risk it could undermine the programs that manufacturers like ourselves are running. Um, but at the moment, it's like I say, it's given, certainly given me some more clarity as to what you were saying earlier as to the clear differences in expectations and the outcomes from it. Yeah, I, I mean, hence the reason I, I'm trying to make it absolutely clear what the expectations should be, because if expectations don't uh, match reality, it, it's going to fail, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, Malcolm, I'm not sure if this question was directed at me, but I'll ask anyway. Will will this survive a change of government? So it's in statute, it's in law. So if we do get a change of government in 18 months' time, and it's a different government from what we've got now, and they um, and they want to change things, it's going to take several years to change. Right. Yeah. Uh, and also, is the range of employment opportunities available throughout the country? Yeah. The employer is engaging with it, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, Ian, I think your question has been asked, uh, answered, which is the set number of hours. So that's 315. Um, another question from Ian is, how do you see T-levels fitting in or is it an alternative to what we deem as conventional apprenticeships? I think we've answered that. 
that it is a, a total alternative. Malcolm, uh, I didn't understand what GSEM was. Oh, it's, it's, it, it's the GSUMs, um, and I have to go back to my slide. To, it, it's, it, it's basically the clarification of the content, okay. um, the, the amplification. Yeah, yeah and, and with regard to engineering council requirements, I've, I've sent them to City and Guilds, suggesting it'd be good to follow those because we want to approve this as a you know an eng tech entry yeah. qualification yeah i just want would have thought that at some stage in all this engineering council might have been uh consulted about yeah. whether they did meet the aaqa uh, yeah. standards so if you want to be a registered engineering technician then this qualification will give you the academic requirement to do so as does a current level three apprenticeship uh, Richard, what would happen to the learner if they lose their employment during their programme? I think the answer to that is they need to find another one, don't they? Yeah. With help yeah. from the provider, yeah. uh, with the help from the college, yeah. yeah. Uh, also from Richard's, uh, David's comment, rework placement starting in year two, does that mean the learner can sit through year one without an employer with the thought they, they don't need an employer until they start year two? I think the answer to that is yes as well, isn't it? I, I think it is. I, I think responsible employers aren't going to want a 16-year-old in their workplace. I mean, they won't have developed any uh, or a great deal of knowledge, skills and behaviours. And part of, or at least an option of the work placement would be for the training provider to think uh, this candidate needs to develop particular skills and put them into a work placement that actually supports that. Yeah, I mean, speaking from, you know, when I was at JCB is you can't, anybody under the age of 18, you, you can't put them out in, in shop floor environments. That was the rule for insurance purposes. So they were next to useless because they were basically office bound if you're on that sort of course, that level three, you know, apprenticeship. Well, I mean, we want mentors to mentor these people, not wet nurses. Yeah. Okay, Richard, uh, will the laddering up to apprenticeships make the candidate ideal pickings for employers to take on before the candidate completes and achieves the T level for their own funding reasons? Interesting. Interesting. That one. It has happened in the past. We all know that. Um, but I, I kind of think it, you know you, what, what we're looking at is is developing a program of study to help a person uh, start and develop a sustainable career. So I think people have got to have that in, at the back of their mind whenever they sort of advise people to jump ship or whatever. Okay, I'm just conscious of time, um, and we, there is a number of questions, so I might just pick out some. To be honest, uh, there is quite a few questions around this, you know, um, the interaction with apprenticeships and and if somebody's got a, a T level, would they go on to an apprenticeship, which I think you, you end up duplicating too much. and It doesn't seem a good route for the person. Uh, and, and just can I just jump in there quickly? Um, there would be a sort of a learning needs analysis. It's not just a case of covering everything. The training provider would actually look at the candidate and assess what is needed. It wouldn't be a case of covering everything again, and the government will not fund learning twice. Yeah. No, they won't, they won't fund learning twice at the same level. But the, the other, there is, I know other, other uh, T levels where there are apprenticeships at level four and above, it, 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 the, the T level is kind of like entry onto a level four and above apprenticeship. I know we, we haven't got that at the moment in, 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 in land-based engineering, but other, other uh, occupations have yeah okay uh one interesting question is has the program been approved or is it still in consultation um it's it's uh it went through approval on the in december 2022 um and so it's it's basically going into production now um ready for providers to start planning their delivery uh, from 2023. So there's been a lot of consultation that has gone on, but still, you know, employees need to get involved so they can sort of um, um, mold their way of thinking within the, within the qualification assessment methodology, et cetera. And qualifications get reviewed 
from time to time. So yeah, there, there, there's a there's a learning curve will be going on. Okay. Just, just just to add to that, yes, I'm part of the uh, the uh, uh, editing team at, at City and Girls for this qualification, and, and we you know we, we're still just uh, crossing the T's and dotting the I's on feedback, not only from employers but from uh, IFAT and um, Ofqual. Okay. So it's kind of a matter of satisfying quite a few bodies, really, which uh, is, can be complex sometimes. Okay, what what I will do now is I'll wrap it up. Uh, from a time perspective if people want to stay on afterwards because there's a few more questions that we can perhaps answer uh, but I'm just conscious of the um, the recording being an hour and a half so so um, I'll draw the event to a close so firstly I'd like to thank our three presenters today for taking the time out to do this for us it is very much appreciated uh, I personally think the T level is a great opportunity to refresh some of the older qualifications uh, and I think the addition of a work placement will give that young person some real valuable early experience, which hopefully will make them want to continue in the industry. So I hope everybody found the presentations informative and can take something away from the event. Just before we go, I'd like to say that our presentations and lectures are normally for I agree members only, but we thought it would be useful to open this up to a wider audience. The recording will be available on our YouTube channel if anybody wishes to watch it or share it. Uh, if any of you are not members of I Agree, then please do consider membership with us. We're not expensive and we offer some great benefits such as networking, lectures, lots of other content, journals, etc. And if any of you run businesses, we do have commercial membership. Again, it's inexpensive and we also encourage technical and engineering staff membership in that. So Please do get in touch. If you're interested, it's dead easy via our website, iagre.org, iagree.org. So that's the hard sell from me over. So thank you very much for joining us and we'll hopefully see you in the future. Bye-bye.